Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the DOT Endangered Species Act consultation process webinar series. We're really excited this morning to be able to kick off this webinar series with our part one. Um, we're really excited also to see so many folks here participating with us and um, really happy to have our agency partners from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries here with us today as well to help um, present this material to you all. <clears throat> so just as a quick um, introduction to our workshop, um, this is a series that's really intended to go through the basics of Endangered Species Act consultation for transportation uh, projects. Our intended audience will generally have some sort of NEPA background or environmental permitting background. And so if for some reason you're attending and you don't necessarily have all that background with you, we do have other resources available that may be helpful to you if you need to learn a little bit more about the transportation development process. Um, but this, again, four-part series will be meeting um, on Tuesday, every Tuesday through March 8th, to talk about um, the different parts of the Endangered Species Act consultation process we will um, spend some time uh, at session two also talking about DOT specifications and construction. We'll also have a guest speaker. Uh, we expect someone to be with us to speak about small tooth sawfish. Um, session three, we're expecting a whole bunch of extra guest speakers. Uh, we'll be talking about some project ex um, examples. We'll hopefully be talking about marine turtles, snail kites, the giant manta ray. And then lastly, in session four, um, some more uh, exciting topics, Florida bonneted bat, wildlife refuge system, bald eagles, as well as the black rail. So hopefully you'll get some really great value out of these sessions and uh, we'll enjoy the guest speakers that we have. So before we go any further, um, let me just introduce myself as well as Denise Rock, who's with me on my team today. I'm Katasha Cornwell. I'm with the Department of Transportation at the Office of Environmental Management here um, in Central Office. I've been with DOT for 22 years helping to develop transportation projects. I've spent about half of my career doing environmental permitting, a small stint in utility coordination, and then I've also um, spent my last six, six or so years doing NEPA um, project reviews, as well as supporting this office and DOT with um, protected species and habitat type uh, policy procedure, trainings, that sort of thing. So uh, excited to be here with you guys today. Also for my team is Denise Rock. She's a graduate of um, Western Washington University in Bellingham, Washington. Uh, she has a BS degree in environmental science and she's worked in state government for 17 years. She's done land acquisition, permitting and land management. She spent some time with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and now has been with DOT for about two years now. She's a project delivery coordinator and also has um, a lot of uh, provides a lot of support to our office in the state when, when it comes to protected species and habitat. And she's been instrumental in really getting this uh, training off the ground for us today, along with our agency partners. So um, she might be in the background for a lot of this webinar series, but she'll be help, helping to answer questions and again, providing support in the background. So we appreciate all the efforts that she's put into this. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Kendra Petrus from Stantec to provide us a little bit of technical um, information to make sure our webinar series is going smoothly today. Kendra, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you very much, Katasha. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first of the four-part webinar series. My name is Kendra Putris, and I'll be supporting our presenters today with this online event. You can submit your questions and comments at any time through the question box that's located on your GoToWebinar dash, uh, dashboard. Uh, we will be pausing during the presentation to address any questions or comments that come in, and we'll revisit other questions and comments at the end of the presentation as well. There are some handouts tagged to your GoToWebinar dashboard that you're available to download. And just a reminder that this session is also being recorded. We will be making the materials from today's event, including a recording of the session, available at a later date. So we'll now turn it back over to Katasha to start today's presentation. Thanks, Kendra. So just by way of a brief introduction for the moment, we'll introduce our speakers um, more thoroughly later, but we do have Mark Cantrell, and Zakia Williams here with us today from the Fish and Wildlife Service and Dave Rydine and Curtis Gregg also from National Marine Fisheries Service and 
we really obviously couldn't be putting on this training without them. So we appreciate all of their support and willingness to partner with us on this and provide you guys this really good content. So with that, I am going to go ahead and um, I guess briefly I'll say, I'm gonna give a, a bit of a presentation on the DOT specifics when it comes to ESA consultation. Um, Zakia will then uh, present her information. We'll have some Q&A like uh, Kendra said with a, with a short break. And then Dave Rydine will come in and speak as well with again, another opportunity for questions at the end. Um, so just so I'm not a distraction to either myself or to you all, I am going to turn off my camera um, as I go through the um, slides for the DOT section of this training. So we do have a handful of objectives today to review to set the stage for the DOT's role in Endangered Species Act compliance and kind of how ESA is considered throughout the project development process. And then, as I said before, before um, our agency partners will delve into the more specifics of the law and the different policies and procedures that they have. So our objectives, basically, as you can see here on the slide today, is to talk about DOT's role as the lead agency, because even after um, five years of our NEPA assignment, um, it still can be a little bit tricky for folks to understand what our responsibilities are. And then I'll talk about the responsibilities that we have for making effect determinations, um, the use of programmatic consultation keys, and then how we document some of this information into our pd &E studies. So again, I'm gonna be running through this at a bit of a high level. Um, so if we do have additional recorded trainings and information available should you need it if some of this information isn't super um, familiar to you. So again, uh, if you're not familiar, in December of 2016, FHWA assigned DOT its responsibilities under NEPA and other associated laws, which includes the Endangered Species Act. So with this assignment of responsibilities, DOT is the lead agency when a project has either FHWA funding, so Federal Highway Administration funding, or the project is on the uh, interstate system. This lead agency role begins with the DOT uh, pd &E study, and it carries through into the design phase where usually permitting occurs. Sometimes it even carries over into construction if additional consultation activities are necessary. So for projects that don't have a pd &E phase, but do have a NEPA document, DOT is still the lead agency. Most of the discussion that we're gonna to have today is gonna to focus though on those projects that do have a pd &E phase. <clears throat> so in this pd &E phase, right, we're doing our ESA consultation. ESA requires an assessment of the effects to listed species and critical habitat. When ESA consultation is required for a project, then DOT uses a natural resources evaluation to provide both the US Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries the information that they need to review the project with the goal of obtaining concurrence during pd &E. So we'll talk about this in more detail in a minute, but just as a reminder, if we do not, if we make no effect determinations, then consultation is not required for that particular species or critical habitat. So as the lead agency for these federal projects that we're talking about, then DOT will initiate the consultation with the services in the appropriate project phase. When formal consultation is necessary, OEM is required to initiate the consultation. That's part of the, the NEPA assignment um, agreement. So we become, OEM becomes the main point of contact for the services for formal consultation and remains involved in that consultation with the district and the services until a biological opinion is issued. When informal consultation is necessary, the district will conduct that consultation with the services after OEM reviews the natural resource evaluation. And should a project start with informal consultation and then end up requiring formal consultation, then OEM becomes involved in that process. If there is a need to reinitiate consultation during the design phase, Kendra, if you could go back to the previous slide, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, if there is a need to reinitiate consultation during the design phase, um, so I think if you click one more time, there might be a design. Uh, there you go, thank you. Um, the DOT maintains that role of the lead agency, and we will reinitiate consultation with the Fish and Wildlife Service or National Marine Fisheries. The results of this consultation is then provided to the Army Corps of Engineers or the U.S. Coast Guard or even DEP for their state 404 process as well so that they can um, issue their regulatory agency action. For projects that don't have the pd &E phase, what we typically refer to as a type one categorical exclusion, 
or sometimes those type two categorical exclusions, DOT, again, as a lead agency, will initiate the consultation with the services and provide the results of that consultation as part of the permit application to be incorporated into the regulatory agency action. Okay, now we're ready for state projects. Thanks, Kendra. <clears throat> so now switching over, thinking about how we handle the state projects, um, ESA consultation might be required because you need a federal permit or again, to support issuance of a DOT, I mean, sorry, a DEP a state 404 permit. So in these cases, DOT will obtain technical assistance from the services as part of the pd &E study. In these cases, the NRE is not reviewed by OEM and technical assistance is conducted by the district. OEM can provide guidance on these projects if, if requested, if the district needs support. If there's a need to update the technical assistance during the design phase to support the permit, the, the district will coordinate with the services and the results of that technical assistance will be included in the permit application. At the time of permitting for these types of projects, again, the Corps or the Coast Guard will then become the lead agency for the ESA consultation. Um, when both of these agencies need to issue a permit for a specific transportation project, then they'll coordinate to determine who's gonna take that lead. And when a state 404 permit is required, DEP will then coordinate with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to obtain technical assistance to finalize that permit condition. Okay, so all of this information that I've just shared has been clarified with our federal partners. So we had sent out a letter uh, request to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in 2019. This was a result of FHWA looking through our processes and procedures through our NEPA assignment and just saying, you know, hey, we really think y'all should just kind of uh, confirm your lead agency role so everyone's on the same page. So we got response back from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that they do agree with the process that I had laid out. And the Army Corps of Engineers and the U.S. Coast Guard also both provided their um, concurrence with this clarification. So everyone's on the same page with our role. So now that we kind of understand our role, part of that is to make effect determinations. And so I'm not going to dive into these definitions right now. That's um, some of the stuff that the service folks are going to cover with us today. But I do want to make sure it's clear that that is a DOT responsibility and that we make the effect determinations and the services um, take their opportunity to either concur or potentially not concur with the effect determinations that we're making. It's also really important that um, all these different effect determinations are well supported in our documentation, but it's specifically important to make sure that no effect uh, determinations are well documented because again, those permitting agencies, the Corps or the Coast Guard may be relying on those when they're um, issuing their permits. And so we wanna make sure that they have a very high comfort level that our no effect determination is sufficient for their needs as well. So with that, this was also, um, sort of uh, codified in uh, correspondence back and forth between U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and, and DOT. Uh, it, this correspondence it looks similar, but it's a little different. Uh, it clarifies that it's both appropriate for DOT to make those no effect determinations. There was some question about that at one point. We wanted to just make sure it was, you know, we were all on the same page. And it's important to note is that this correspondence also allows DOT to use programmatic consultation keys that have been coordinated with other agencies. So we'll talk about a couple of these keys here coming up, but you can think about the Indigo Snake key or the Woodstork key. And these are the types of keys that we're talking about. So something that's already been negotiated with another federal partner like the Army Corps of Engineers, this correspondence confirms that it is appropriate for DOT to use that information to document our effect determinations as long as we're using these appropriately um, in our NEPA document. So what do those look like? So these, uh, on the next slide, we can see the keys that we have agreed are appropriate for DOT to use. Um, and yes, I know the Florida Panther looks like a tiger. <laughs> so apologize for not having a better, a little graphic there. But um, <clears throat> we have developed a list that goes along with that letter that was on the previous slide that explains exactly which uh, consultation keys are available for DOT to use. We do update this list on occasion as new keys come out or maybe a key gets revised. So um, I had said the word appropriate a couple of times. 
And so when it's appropriate, we can use a programmatic consultation key to determine the anticipated effects. But what do we really mean by appropriate? The user of the key should really read the entire key and understand it before you kind of jump down to that final decision tree that's usually at the end of the key. Um, sometimes there's going to be a caveat about how the key can be used in certain areas. So occasionally certain counties have certain caveats or requirements or restrictions, or maybe the type of work is um, needs to be reviewed to make sure you're using the key appropriately. So um, we can also think about appropriateness when it comes to the federal versus the state projects, right? So remember the first couple of slides, the differences there for federal projects, we're using the key to complete the consultation process. If we're talking about a state project, we're only using that key as technical assistance. It doesn't really kind of close that loop necessarily for consultation until the permit has been issued. Another important point when using the key is to confirm that any of the required conservation measures can be followed, right? So sometimes if you think about the Florida Bonnet to back key, depending on your um, effect determination, you're gonna be required to follow a handful of conservation measures. If those for some reason cannot be followed, then you're gonna need to go back to the services and consult with them directly to make sure that you've completed that consultation process. <clears throat> So um, what does it look like to kind of document the, the key, the use of the key? When a key is used, um, we wanna make sure that we're, it, it's well documented. So one approach to doing that is, you know, actually highlighting the pathway of the key that you're using. So this example highlights, you know, where you go, we go to B, we go to C, we go to D, we go to E. So basically we're using the whole pathway here, but we do get to a final, not likely to adversely affect determination. Um, occasionally you're gonna use a key and you're not gonna go through each step, right? You're gonna have to document um, the steps that you did follow. You wanna document also the date uh, that the key was used so we know what version of the key that's being used because like I said before, they do get updated on occasion. Um, so <clears throat> if you use a key for certain species, but you have other species that require sort of direct consultation with the services, then you're gonna document the use of this key within your natural resource evaluation. Um, and this lets the services know that you weren't just ignoring these species that have a key, but you're letting them know, hey, I've walked through the key, this is the pathway I've taken, and just this is the result that I've obtained. So that everyone's on the same page knowing how that species will be addressed for your project. So again, in this example, we're highlighting the pathway, we get the not likely to adversely affect. One other way to document the use of a key might just be to kind of write a narrative of how you stepped through this process if attaching a highlighted version isn't um, appropriate for your, for your particular project. In addition to um, documenting the use of a key in say a natural resource evaluation, you can also um, document the use of a key or your no effect determinations directly onto a type one categorical exclusion checklist form, if that's appropriate, if a natural resource evaluation wasn't required. So in this case, you can see on the screen here that we have two different locations within the type one form to be able to do that. There's a text box for each of these scenarios where you can explain the species that were um, used, either for the, where you got a no effect or the keys that were used. And you would really want to include your rationale for these determinations here as well. So again, very important that the keys or the no effect determinations are well documented. So not only is it a defensible thing for our NEPA document, but it's also something that can support that permitting decision later if necessary. So beyond the keys that I've been mentioning so far, there's also programmatic approaches that DOT has developed in consultation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for specific listed species in Florida. Um, these programmatic approaches are ones, again, directly negotiated between DOT and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And um, our first one uh, happened back in 2017. Uh, this is the updated version shown on the slide here that was revised in 2018. Um, these different programmatic approaches are intended to address frequent routine activities conducted by DOT that have predictable repetitive outcomes and which can set consistent expectations statewide for these activities 
and provide consistent measures to avoid or minimize impacts to the species. So we all have little, you know, limited time, limited staff, limited resources, right? So not only DOT or consultants have that sort of limited time, but our, our agency partners do as well. So the intent of these programmatics is really to um, allow us to all focus on the bigger projects with more uh, sort of critical impacts and, and let these lower project or these smaller project impacts be something that we can just kind of like go through at a, at a more quick, quicker, efficient pace. So um, between the one we have uh, up there now and then the programmatic approach that we're showing um, on the left with the minor transportation activities, we've covered a total of 29 different listed species um, out of the 69 that we have uh, from an animal perspective uh, listed in Florida. And I'm gonna talk about these two programmatics in detail in a minute, but a couple more that we have underway. Um, and these are some of the species here on this, in the picture that are covered by the minor transportation activities. Um, our next programmatic that we have underway is for the Panama City crayfish specifically. This is a unique approach where DOT is actually contributing to the recovery plan for the crayfish. And then um, we're getting a countywide coverage for the species. It only occurs in Bay County, but we're getting countywide coverage for this on all types of DOT activities. So the previous uh, two programmatics that we talked about are pretty uh, small in scope in the sense that they're really focused on maintenance and, and sort of smaller in right of way project activities. This Panama City crayfish programmatic is going to be addressing uh, larger projects as well as those sort of. Um, maintenance of related activities. And then lastly, we're really excited to be working towards the Monarch Candidate Conservation Agreement with Assurances. This is another programmatic approach. This is a nationwide programmatic approach that both DOTs and utilities can um, become, part, become part of through a certificate of inclusion. And so this is something that DOT is considering pretty strongly and it will provide coverage for this candidate species for both, again, minor right-of-way activities as well as maintenance activities that could affect the monarch butterfly. So let's look at our first uh, programmatic approach in just a little bit more detail. This one was specifically um, developed for freshwater mussels. It was again approved back in 2017 with a slight update in 2018. It covers 14 listed freshwater mussel species that are in districts two and three, pretty much all, all but one is in district uh, uh, three. And then um, it also addresses the critical habitat for these species as well. Again, this PA covers pretty much the minor type activities related to road work and bridge maintenance. And the results of the consultation result in either no effect or are not likely to adversely affect the listed mussels along with any appropriate conservation measures that are required. And they have like really fun names. So this was just a really fun slide to, <laughs> to highlight a few of those listed species. Again, that second programmatic that I talked about was approved last year. It was developed as the result of this districts requesting to provide predictable outcomes for minor projects and being able to make more accurate, consistent, and efficient effect determinations on similar projects that, again, we routinely perform that have minimal to no impact. So uh, a large majority of the projects that we have here at DOT are those you know, kind of lower level impact projects. So it's really important to be able to kind of have that consistent and repeatable um, approach and, and kind of getting predictable outcome, not only for the DOT project, but also for the species as well. So this programmatic covers 15 different species and 27 different construction activities. Uh, again, this your project has to be with an existing right of way to be able to use this programmatic approach, but covers a lot of projects still. It provides conservation measures that are required for a certain combination of activities and the affected species. And as long as the conditions of the, pro of the programmatic can be followed and the conservation measures can be adhered to, then no further consultation is required when the PA gives you a, not, a no effect or a not likely to adversely affect determination. The US Coast Guard has concurred with the use of this programmatic agreement in both the Florida uh, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection have provided letters of support for this as well. One point of clarification um, is that the, the PA can be used for state projects as technical assistance. The, the PA does uh, say that, but I think there's still some confusion on a regular basis. So I just wanna be really clear that it can be used for technical assistance. 
<clears throat> so we've been working really hard with our uh, technology team to develop the a tool within what we call SWEPT, our statewide environmental project tracker. Uh, we're developing a module within that tracker so that the, pro the programmatic agreement can be used um, from project to project. And the intent basically is to provide a consistent user experience, a consistent way to document. Uh, as I said earlier, documentation is really important. And also a really easy push of the button sort of reporting, because um, as with most things, right, we have to report out to our service partners how we're using the key in the, in, in the programmatic agreement and making sure that they understand that we are uh, using it appropriately and uh, reporting out the conservation measures that we're applying to our projects. So this will, uh, this module should be linking directly to that type one and or type two categorical exclusion form uh, once it's developed to, so that that documentation is pretty seamless for your projects. So now that we have um, kind of talked a little bit about making those effective terminations and the responsibilities that we have as a lead agency, um, let's talk a little bit more about documenting this information in our natural resources evaluation. Um, so just to be clear, we haven't really talked about how to go about getting to your effective termination. We haven't talked about all the field work and the desktop analysis and all that analysis that needs to happen before you get to your effective termination, but that, that is all going to take place. Now we're really just talking about documenting all that hard work that's been done. So as I mentioned previously, the natural resource evaluation is the technical report that we use to provide the information to our agency partners on what we've been doing and um, what those effective terminations are. The natural resource evaluation is really, um, I think we need to go back. Oh no, I'm sorry, you don't, you're okay. The natural resources evaluation really covers three different sections. It covers the um, endangered species and other listed species. It covers wetlands and it covers the essential fish habitat. And one really important point to take home here today um, and throughout this session is really that endangered species are not the same as EFH. This gets confused a lot. When National Marine Fisheries is involved, a lot of times people wanna lump everything under EFH and that's just a separate resource, but National Marine Fisheries has purview over both different laws and resources. So, um, but the natural resource evaluation is required uh, when we have one of these different um, sort of situations occurring. So if you need to get concurrence for your effective terminations on endangered species, an NRE is required. If the project requires a standard permit, um, a regional general permit because of unavoidable wetland impacts, then an NRE is required. If you have adverse effects to essential fish habitat, an NRE is required. So if any one of these things is true, then a natural resource evaluation is developed and again, the intent of this is to provide information to the services um, as a technical report. So on the next slide, you'll see that, again, that's really the intent of what we're getting at. Uh, we're continuing that consultation and coordination process that started earlier in the project development process during what we call our ETDM, Efficient Transportation Decision-Making um, Review that our uh, agency partners you know, work with us on. That's their first look at the project. This natural resource evaluation is kind of like their next opportunity to see where we are, um, get a better idea of the refined potential impacts and the conservation measures that we're looking at providing to address the species effects. So because um, this is a technical document going out to our agency partners and we're seeking concurrence, then for federal projects, OEM does review the, the uh, NRE before it goes out to the agencies, regardless of that federal class of action. When it comes to state listed projects, we are not reviewing, um, I'm sorry, state funded projects. We are not reviewing the NRE. So what about projects that don't rise to the level of a natural resource evaluation? Um, on our next slide, we can see where a technical memorandum might be appropriate. So if you don't hit any of those previous thresholds that I mentioned, then you're basically falling under these thresholds on the slide here. So the, what that means is if you don't have um, consultation that's required because you can get to a no effect or because you've used a key that results in no further consultation required, um, your wetland impacts don't rise to anything above a nationwide permit and your EFH impacts are minor, 
then a technical memorandum is appropriate for documenting your um, your endangered species um, resources on your project. So again, because a tech memo is not um, being used for consultation, it's just file documentation, OEM does not have to review these. And it's not to say that we're not also looking at other um, things like state listed species and, and that sort of thing as well. Those are still being addressed in your tech memo, but lower level projects can use this approach. So now that we know the kind of um, technical documentation that we need, what documentation do we need to see in the actual pd &E study, the NEPA document to support the um, all the work that's been done to um, kind of provide that information to the public or the other entities reviewing the NEPA document. So again, we're only focusing here on listed ESA listed species and critical habitat. We're still wanting to document <laughs> Uh, the state listed species, other protected species, other habitat issues, EFH, wetlands, all that good stuff is still going to get documented, but right now we're just focused on ESA. So what we want to see in our NEPA document or our pd &E study is the listing status of the federally listed species and the critical habitat. We want to provide an explanation of how we got to that effect determination. We want to explain the measures that were taken to minimize the impacts to the protected species. And we also want to make sure that the conservation measures that we're agreeing to are being provided as commitments. And commitments are a really big deal to the department, and we have a whole another series of training that deal with commitments. But just um, you know, be aware that that's a very important critical part of our NEPA and PDD um, documentation. We also want this PDD &E document to discuss whether we've gone through informal or formal consultation, and really what the status of that consultation is. Sometimes. We are not able to provide all the information that's necessary for a project. A lot of times when we have pile driving for bridge replacement projects, we just don't have the level of design detail that we need to be able to complete consultation. But this NEPA document or pd &E study really needs to explain um, where we are in the process, what information is still required, and provide a commitment that consultation will continue later on into the design and permitting phase if it cannot be completed during pd &E, which is our goal, if at all possible. Um, and then if we have completed uh, consultation, we want to be able to provide the concurrence letters into our NEPA document specifically to show that that consultation has been completed. <clears throat> All right, so now as we've you know, made it through consultation and pd &E, we've done all that really great documentation for our NEPA document, what happens later on in design and permitting? So I touched on this earlier at the beginning, but just to review, um, when a project advances to the design and permitting phase, the team that's working on this, so whether they're the DOT staff and consultant staff, they should review the natural resources evaluation, um, kind of see what the results of that consultation were, what were those commitments that were made, and determine if there's been any changes to the project that have occurred since that environmental document was approved. This means that they should evaluate if the impacts have changed or those effects have changed, determine if there's any new species or habitat that have been listed or maybe discovered within the project limits. If they have any of these sort of situations, right, like new species or changes to effects, then consultation may need to be reinitiated. Um, if it's formal consultation, again, um, a biological opinion might have been issued, and that biological opinion will probably also provide other um, requirements for when consultation needs to be reinitiated. So once you go through the design process, um, looking at all the different results of your consultation and updating that, um, you're gonna use that the results of your consultation, your design plans, and any other updated documentation that you have to be able to support your permit applications. And again, just as a reminder, when it comes to the state funded side, um, that consultation was not completed during pd &E. It would only have been technical assistance but DOT may still want to refresh that technical assistance during design to support those permit applications and make sure that the most um, thorough and robust information is available for those permitting agencies to use as their starting point. So with that, um, that pretty much covers all of the different uh, objectives I wanted to discuss today. As I mentioned, uh, we do have a lot of other resources available. And so one good starting place is our pd &E manual. Chapters um, 16 and 17 cover uh, some of this information and distinguish between ESA and EFH, if that's a point of confusion for anyone. 
We have a natural resources evaluation outline and guidance document as well. That's, that's super helpful in explaining how to document information to provide to the services for your ESA consultation purposes. And we also have um, an OEM training program, specifically Tract 5 covers the natural resources um, side of things and provides a lot of good details there as well. So if anybody needs more uh, support or information on that, just let us know and we'll get you guys with links and everything that you might need. So I think with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our agency partners that are here with us today. Um, as I said before, we're gonna have one speaker, then we'll have a time for Q&A and a break, and then we'll have a final um, uh, in-depth uh, presentation and then a wrap up. But Mark Cantrell, who's with us today with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, is our statewide transportation coordinator and liaison. He earned a bachelor's of science and a master's of science in wildlife and fisheries from the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. He has over 30 years of experience in research management, administration, in various aspects of fish and wildlife conservation with the federal and state agencies in the Southeast. His particular interests are restoration of ecosystems and working lands and waters. Mark has worked to study, negotiate, and restore ecosystem functions through innovative approaches across the Southeast and beyond. He's also the chair of the Southeastern Fisher, Fishes Council, a nonprofit scientific organization dedicated to the study and conservation of freshwater and coastal fishes of the Southeastern United States. So Mark has um, really been uh, instrumental in making sure that we're also prepared, well prepared for this webinar series today. And we really appreciate his support and getting us to um, you know, today's first webinar. He um, has provided uh, a lot of good background for us over the years, and we really appreciate his support as an ETAP member. Um, also with us from the Fish and Wildlife Service is Akia Williams, another one of our um, super supportive folks. We're really happy to have her with us today to give the first uh, session from the services standpoint. But Zakia is a transportation biologist and liaison with the Florida Department of Transportation at the Fish and Wildlife Services Jacksonville Ecological Services Office. Zakia has worked for the service since 2011. Prior to that, she worked as a natural resource specialist for the U.S. Department of Ag, Natural Resource Conservation Services. Um, she worked on the Farm Bill easement program when she was there. She has a BS in wildlife ecology and conservation with a minor in zoology from the University of Florida. Go Gators, I agree. <laughs> uh, and she enjoys crafting and spending time with her family. And again, we're really super happy to have Zakia here with us today to present. Our second presenter is gonna be Dave Rydeen uh, from National Marine Fisheries Service. He's been a really, another really great ETAP member for us for a long time. And I've always appreciated working with Dave. Um, super, super helpful all the time. Uh, but Dave is a fish biologist with National Marine Fisheries in the Southeast Regional Offices Habitat Conservation Division. Again, another DOT ETAP liaison um, for both essential fish habitat, which we talked about before, right? And ESA, which we're talking about today. Um, so he helps review projects along the Gulf Coast of Florida for districts one, two, three, and seven. Dave has worked in his current position at National Marine Fisheries for over 17 years. And before that had extensive experience as an estuarine and a coral reef e uh, fish ecologist. He worked on EISs for the generic EFH amendments for the Gulf of Mexico and US Caribbean Fish Management Councils. He holds an undergraduate degree in zoology from the University of Rhode Island and a master's and PhD in marine biology from the Florida Institute of Technology. So Dave, thanks so much for being here with us today to um, be one of our presenters. And then last but not least, uh, Curtis Gregg is a natural resource specialist with the um, with National Marine Fisheries as well in the Southeast Regional Habitat Conservation Division. He's also one of our ETAP members. He's a little bit newer, but Curtis has been, an, been doing an awesome job helping us out getting this um, presentation and this webinar series ready and off the ground as well. He uh, helps review projects in DOT districts two, four, five, and six. He recently accepted this position after nearly 10 years as a contractor with National Marine Fisheries supporting NOAA Coral Reef Conservation Program and conducting EFH consultations in South Florida and in the Keys. Prior to working with NIMPS, Curtis worked for the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and the South Florida Water Management District in environmental resource permitting. Curtis holds an undergraduate degree in fisheries and wildlife sciences from North Carolina State University and a master of science degree um, in the program evaluation from 
Florida State University. So Florida is pretty well represented here with Gators and Seminoles. <laughs> but um, thanks so much, guys, for being here with us. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Zakia to start her presentation. Thank you. Zakia, I'm not sure I see your slide, um, but if you are speaking, you're on mute. I wasn't. <laughs> good morning, good morning. My name is Zakia Williams, just in case you missed it. And this morning, I'm going to give you an overview of the ESA. Um, I promise to make this as painless as possible. Um, I have two goals that I want to achieve today. One is to help you ID major sections of the Act. And the second goal is to put the Section 7 in its proper conservation context within the Act. So uh, just like Katasha, I'm going to go ahead off screen so I don't distract you. Um, and let's get started. Next slide, Kendra. Um, the Endangered Species Act was uh, first in 1966, the Endangered Species Preservation Act listed native animal species as endangered but gave them limited protection. It was later amended in 1969 to prevent worldwide extinction. The Endangered Species Act was passed in 1973, superseding this precursor of the 60s, and is probably the boldest law passed in our country. No political controversy, overwhelming support in both the House and the Senate. The Act says that our country will not do anything that will result in the extinction of a species. The law's purpose is not to merely preserve specimens of rare species in zoos, but basically to restore the ecosystems in which they depend, which is really important. The ESA has changed very little in the last 50 years, except some notable amendments, which came in 1986 with the addition of the Habitat Conservation Plans, commonly known as HCPs. Next. The Endangered Species Act has 18 sections. Notice that there is no section one. The Fish and Wildlife Service focuses heavily on administering section seven of the act, and in some cases, section 10, when there is no federal nexus involved. In section two, it describes our finding and purpose. The findings are some species of fish, wildlife, and plants that are extinct as a consequence of economic growth and development, untempered by adequate concern and conservation. Other species are in danger of extinction. Species have aesthetic, ecological, educational, historical, recreational, and scientific value. The purpose of this is to provide a means whereby the ecosystems upon which endangered and threatened species depend may be conserved. So the policy of Congress states that all federal departments and agencies shall seek to conserve endangered and threatened species and shall utilize the authorities in furtherance of purposes of the act. Some key definitions that are thrown around all the time when we describe and talk about the ESA are endangered, which is any species in, in danger of extinction throughout all a significant portion of its range threaten any species likely to become endangered in the foreseeable future, and critical habitat, specific geographical areas that, specific geographic areas with physical and biological features essential to the conservation of a listed species. These definitions are actually in section three of the ESA. Other important definitions are in 50 Code of Federal Regulations. Um, this is for harm and harass, and 402.02 for Section 7. The Code of Federal Regulations 
as mentioned in this slide, is a codification of the federal government's rule and regulations published in the Federal Registry. We'll talk about the Federal Registry a little bit later. Unlike the Federal Register, the CFR contains merely the final and effective rules of federal agencies and related official interpretations of the rule. We've downlisted the manatee to threaten. Um, I have it here as endangered, um, but we have downlisted it to threaten. We can all give ourselves a round of applause for those efforts. Other key, I'm sorry, other key definitions are conserve, conserving, and conservation, which is to use and use all methods and procedures which are necessary to bring any endangered species or threatened species to the point at which the measure provided pursuant to this act are no longer necessary. And recovery, improvement in the status of species to the point at which listing is no longer appropriate under the criteria set out in sections 4A1 of the act. Next in section four is determination of threatened and endangered species, which include listing, species in critical habitat, protective regulations, recovery, and delisting. These are things that are found in the Federal Register. The Federal Register is the official journal of the federal government of the United States. It contains government agency rules, proposed rules, and public notices. It is published every weekday except on federal holidays. So what's eligible for listing? Species of plants and animals, subspecies including plant varieties, distinct population segments of vertebrates, and nymphs also include evolutionary significant units. Listing. Factors to be considered in determining whether a species is in danger or threatened are if they are present or threatened destruction, modification, or curtailment of the species range or habitat, overuse for commercial, recreational, scientific, or educational purposes, disease or predation, inadequacy of existing regulatory mechanisms, other natural or man-made factors affecting the continued existence of the species. Species that are proposed for listing, which is any species for which the Fish and Wildlife Service or NOAA has published in the Federal Register, is a proposed rule to list or threaten, to list as threatened or endangered. These species are not protected by the Endangered Species Act and conference procedures apply. So a conference is, um, like each federal agency shall confer with the service on any action which is likely to jeopardize the continued existence of any proposed species or result in a destruction or adverse modification of proposed critical habitat. So the conference is used when the conference is designed to assist the federal agencies and any applicant in identifying and resolving potential conflicts at an early stage in the process um, when it comes to listing a species. A candidate species. I think Katasha mentioned um, some candidate species in her um, in her in her PowerPoint. Um, these are species that are not protected by the Endangered Species Act. The Fish and Wildlife Service does a status uh, completes the status review. A listing proposal is warranted, but precluded by higher priority listing activities. Fish and Wildlife Service treats candidate species as if they are proposed for listing during interest service consultations. NIMS species that are undergoing a status review announced in the Federal Register notice whether or not they are the subject of a petition. Critical habitat. Critical habitat requires a formal designation process, a rulemaking published in the Federal Register, designates specific geographical areas on which are found those physical or biological features essential to the conservation of the species and which may require special management or protection. It may include areas not currently occupied by the species, but that are needed for recovery of the species. 
It's the only part of the ESA that requires an economic analysis. This is a, uh, the critical habitat map for Florida. Um, you can see all of the red and pink areas. Those are critical habitat for the species that we have in Florida, for the TNE species that we have in Florida. Uh, critical habitat requires additional review in Section 7 consultation. It does not create a preserve or require any action from the landowner or manager. It's next distinction of the EFH. This is an example of a typical critical habitat map. Um, this is for the frosted flatwood salamanders. Um, this one, the critical habitat units depicted in this um, in this map are for Baker, Franklin, Jefferson, Liberty, and Wakulla counties in Florida, and some counties in uh, South Carolina. Uh, it also describes the primary constituent elements for the critical habitat, which is the breeding habitat and the non-breeding habitat. All of the small boxes depict those units and where the uh, frosted salamanders have been um, uh, have occurrence data. Recovery and delisting. Recovery is the process by which the decline of an endangered or threatened species is arrested or reversed and threats to its survival are neutralized so that its long-term survival in nature can be ensured. The goal of this process is the maintenance of secure, self-sustaining wild populations of species with the minimum necessary investment of resources. A recovery plan delineates, justifies, and schedules the, search, the research and management of actions necessary to support recovery of a species, including those that, if successfully undertaken, are likely to permit reclassification or delisting of the species. So this is the end of section four of the act. We're basically going to skip section five. Um, but just know that Section 5 basically deals with land acquisition, um, like for example, with the Forest Service and uh, the wildlife ma management refuges. Uh, cooperation with the state. The secretary may enter into cooperative agreements with any state that maintains a program to conserve listed species by conducting research acquiring land and implementing other conservation actions. It's, they can enter into management agreements with any state to manage areas that were established for the conservation of listed species, provide financial assistance to any state with a conservation program for listed species to conduct research, fund development of habitat conservation plans, fund acquisition of lands needed for recovery, and to assist in implementing habitat conservation plans. Usually the funding cycles are yearly, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA staff work with state staff to develop proposals that are submitted for funding by the state. Interagency cooperation. Uh, Section 7A1, federal, agency, federal agencies shall use the authorities to carry out their programs for the conservation of endangered and threatened species. Conservation the use of methods and procedures to bring an endangered or threatened species to the point where provisions of the ESA are no longer necessary. Each agency has a duty to avoid jeopardy and adverse modification of critical habitat. Section 7A2, uh, federal agencies must ensure that actions they fund, authorize, or carry out not likely to jeopardize, that are not likely to jeopardize the continued existence of listed species or adversely modify or destroy critical habitat. So, so some things that are prohibited um, by the act, this is section nine. Section 9A1B says that it is unlawful for any person subject to the jurisdiction of the United States to take any such species. Take is defined as to harm, harass, pursue, hunt, shoot, 
wound, kill, trap, capture, or collect, or to attempt to engage in these activities. Section 9A1 also prohibits importing or exporting listed wildlife from the U.S., take on the high seas, possession and selling of other activities not specifically relevant to Section 7A2. Section 3 of the Endangered Species Act also states that a person means an individual, corporation, partnership, trust, association, or any other private entity or any officer, employee, agent, department, or instrument or instrumental instrumentality of the federal government of any state, municipality, or political subdivision of a state, or of any foreign government, any state, municipality, or political subdivision of a state, or any other entity subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. Um, it also uh, says that in section nine, it, um, that it also, also that it also prohibits importing or exporting listed wildlife from the U.S., take on the high seas, possession and selling, and other activities not specifically relevant to Section 7A2. No one, not the federal government or non-federal, is allowed to take an individual of a listed species of animal without an exemption or a permit. Absolutely no one. <laughs> Noah's definition also includes spawning and rearing here too. Note that take applies to individuals, not habitat, including critical habitat. This definition goes to linking habitat loss with death or injury of, you can go back one, Kendra. Uh, this definition goes to linking habitat loss with death or injury of the individual animal. Impacts to habitat are by far the most extensive source of harm to listed species, leading to take and most common and comprehensive aspect of the effects of the action analysis. Next slide. Okay. Prohibited acts. This is also in section nine. Uh, harass is defined as an intentional or ne negligent act or mission which creates the likelihood of injury to wildlife by annoying it to such an extent as to significantly disrupt normal behavior patterns which include but are not limited to breeding, feeding, or sheltering. Harm is defined as an act which actually kills or injures wildlife. Such act may include significant habitat modification or degradation where it actually kills or injures wildlife by significantly impairing essential behavior patterns, including breeding, feeding, or sheltering. Take applies to individuals, not habitat. Prohibited acts of plants. This is section 9A2. It establishes the prohibition, the prohibitions with regard to endangered species of plants. Prohibitions vary depending on the work ownership of the lands. Prohibitions also different from threatened, differ from threatened and endangered species because the Fish and Wildlife Service did not extend the same Section 4D protections to plants as it did for wildlife. Um, plants were not accorded the same level of protection as animals. They were accorded uh, much less protection. Um, this this was brought about because the the rule the law was it's the old english law that says that plants go with the land and belong to the landowner and animals move around and belong to the crown basically so section 9a2 also prohibits importing or exporting listed plants from the u.s interstate and foreign commerce and other activities not specifically relevant to section 7a2 There are some exceptions in Section 10 of the Act. Section 10A1A, also known as, is also known as recovery permits, enhance of survival permits. The purpose of the permit is to take in some manner individuals of listed species for research or recovery activities so that um, you, can, you can collect, capture, weigh, measure, 
take blood, issue samples, et cetera. So these are the 10A, 1A permits, they, also known as scientific take permits. And then we have our incidental take permits, the section 10A, 1B, also known as habitat conservation planning, also known as HCPs. These are for projects with take that is incidental to otherwise legal activities available to entities without a federal nexus. So these provide um, essentially the same thought process as a section 7A, um, A2, but it's more complicated. If you want to build or do something on private land and a listed animal species is likely to be taken in the course of that action, NOAA or Fish and Wildlife Service would advise would advise you to apply for an incidental take permit pursuant to this section of the Endangered Species Act. Remember that the trigger for getting a federal agency involved with Section 7 is if the action may affect the listed species or critical habitat. For actions that have no federal nexus, the trigger is that incidental take is likely to result from the action. Next slide, please. Um, so with that, I'm gonna um, talk about section seven, um, section 11, which is penalties and enforcements. Uh, this it provides for civil or criminal penalties for the ESA violations, and it provides for citizens lawsuits to compel the secretaries to enforce the ESA. So basically what it does is it involves um, the, the law enforcement office, um, which are highly trained LE officers with lots of knowledge in, about wildlife and um, the ESA. For the Fish and Wildlife Service, the process for law enforcement usually starts with the staff person talking to a supervisor, and then they contact the division of law enforcement, which then works with the solicitors and the Department of Justice. It is a long and complicated process. Um, the ESA has, oh, it is a long and complicated process. Okay. With that, I'm going to end on this note. The ESA has 18 sections, but for our purposes, we rarely go beyond these sections. Um, you can also do the research if you um, are so inclined on the ESA. It is available online. Um, now that you have a broader background of the Endangered Species Act, it is about time that we start focusing on Section 7A2, which my counterpart, Dave Rydine, will go into detail with you. Um, however, before we do that, we're gonna pause and take some questions. Thank you. Thanks, Aki, a great presentation. I appreciate it. Um, the highlights that you provided with the differences between how you guys look at ESA and some of the definitions and a little bit of the uh, additional things that National Marine Fisheries Services looks at as well. That was that was new to me, so I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> and also that um, when we're talking about the needing that federal nexus or, or not and having that federal nexus, I suppose, that the incidental take being likely to result is that key for when we don't have um, the federal nexus. So, so great job. Thank you very much for that. We have a handful of questions. Um, a couple of the questions have been responded specifically to the recipients, but uh, for the whole audience, um, let me just say we've got um, a question about our programmatic approaches for the minor transportation activities. Uh, the question is, does that take the place of some of the older keys or can we choose which key to use? And um, basically, um, they don't necessarily take the place of those older keys, but if you um, do fall within the requirements of the minor activities um, transportation programmatic, it would probably be most appropriate to use that uh, for the meantime. And as a reminder, those are for that key, uh, programmatic approach is specifically for projects with an existing right of way. So you may have some larger projects that fall outside of that and need to use the other uh, keys that are you know, negotiated between the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and say the Army Corps of Engineers. So, but if you can use the programmatic, that'll probably be the first choice. Um, our second question talks about um, does concurrence need to be refreshed if the year, if it's, you know, several years old, but there's no new protected species or habitat, or there's no newly listed species, or there's no major design changes. And I think 
for the most part in Mark or Zakia, if you want to also add on to this one, I think for the most part, the answer would be, you probably don't have to go back through consultation if everything is still, um, you know, up to, in terms of, you know, nothing has changed, right? You're not having design changes. You haven't had new species. You probably don't need to go back through consultation per se, but it's probably worth a conversation with um, either your district staff and, and OEM um, just to make sure that that's still okay. Um, but Mark, Sakia, anything to add on that in terms of like number of years that have passed and whether or not you guys might prefer to see an update? Um, I would say that you, 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 can you can hear me. Um, I would say that uh, if nothing has changed with the project or no new species are involved, um, you wouldn't have to, uh, you know, go back for another concurrence. It will still be good. If anything changes, then uh, the consultation will need to be reinitiated. Very good. Thanks. Appreciate that. Um, and then I was just kind of curious also, I know you mentioned Zakia um, about the economic analysis just very briefly. And I was wondering if maybe Mark would be able to just kind of give us a, a brief uh, explanation of what that economic ana economic analysis is, and maybe just explain how you invite DOT to participate in that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think uh, economics uh, play a strong role in design and implementation of uh, and, and effectiveness of uh, actions under the Endangered Species Act. So. Uh, economics play a big part in everything we do, uh, especially for uh, uh, endangered species. Uh, it's really important because uh, over 90% of endangered species occur on private lands. So that uh, uh, that can be a real important uh, factor. Uh, but primarily, the, uh, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, is required to do an economic analysis of the impacts of designating critical habitat. And so that's one, one part where we have a, uh, have a formal economic analysis uh, that we do. And uh, we rely heavily on uh, FDOT to provide input there. And so we've been able to, uh, to get uh, for species that we've uh, recently designated uh, critical habitat or proposed designating critical habitat uh, we've been able to uh, to get some really good on the ground information about uh, about not only uh, uh, how much it costs DOT to uh, 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 to do its uh, its evaluations for for the species or for the types of habitats and its projects, uh, but uh, how it might uh, uh, affect some of the decisions it makes. So uh, so it's really uh, really important information that we get from. Uh, uh, from the Department of Transportation when we're evaluating the economic impacts uh, of, uh, of critical habitat designations. We do that at the proposed stage and then again at the formal stage and as so we have uh, uh, economists who work uh, work for the Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, and, and do those uh, those important analysis uh, looking looking forward. And so uh, uh, so besides uh, besides that, it's also uh, really important for us to consider the economic impacts of recovery plans and implementation of recovery plans. Uh, all of that uh, especially depends uh, on the economics of making it happen. Uh, we can sometimes know how to recover a species, but we just don't have the funding to do it. And uh, and so that. Uh, that's an important part of how Congress uh, funds the federal government uh, to to do what uh, it does, not only to recover endangered species, but to to balance the other uh, uh, other necessary parts of running a federal government. And uh, and so uh, that's uh, that's another place where uh, being able to work with uh, private landowners uh, to recover species on private lands uh, is important. Economics again, uh, finding congruent uh land uh land management uh, activities that uh, that allow endangered species to thrive on private lands is uh is something that uh, that we just cannot uh, uh underestimate that's uh, uh very important there uh, again like i said 90 percent of endangered species occur on private lands so there's a, a real balance there to make that uh, uh 
make that work for endangered species and work for private landowners so that uh, so that so that their uh, land ownership is uh, economically viable. Uh, so all, all of those things uh, factor into decisions uh, that landowners make when uh, uh, when looking at how to manage their land and timing of uh, land management activities. Uh, but the economic analysis that uh, that the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service does uh, is uh, is certainly informed by the detailed information that you all can bring forward in talking about uh, your decisions for transportation, and uh, and and we've. Uh, uh, really appreciated that detailed information as it helps uh, helps make our job easier when we're considering how to uh, how to designate critical habitat and how to protect endangered species uh, throughout Florida and and even beyond. Uh, so I hope that uh, gives you some idea that uh, that yes uh, we do consider uh, uh, economics and uh, uh, endangered species recovery and in the decisions that we make for designating critical habitat. And uh, uh, it can be expensive, but again, as Congress said, uh, it is very important to preserve endangered species, to protect them uh, from extinction. And uh, again, Zakia mentioned it early on that with those purposes, Congress set forth the Endangered Species Act, an act that was originally uh, signed as uh, unanimous in both the House and Senate uh, by all parties. And, uh, and we, we continue to, uh, to spend a lot of time and effort and, uh, and think that uh, uh, the economics uh, are an important part of how we make that balance and, uh, and make it work. Yeah, thanks, Mark. That's a really good overview of that process and the importance uh, I think that we play in that and being able to respond. So we've been seeing you know, an uptick in uh, I think those requests um, through our NEPA assignment and just really appreciate um, that perspective that you shared. And I think it gives those folks that are maybe um, with us today that have participated in that just a little bit of background about, you know, why they're doing that, why, why they're putting together all this long list of projects, right, <laughs> that are coming up in a particular area that may be getting uh, habitat designated. Um, but, but yeah, it's an important um, part of the process and, and we're happy to help facilitate wherever we can. So thanks. Um, looks like we have a few other questions in the chat. Uh, we'll just go through a couple more. And um, so one question again about the programmatic agreement uh, that we have for the minor transportation activities, which again, that covers those um, 14, 15, I'm gonna get my number wrong, 15 I think listed species and those 29 transportation activities. That's what we're talking about here. How strict is it when it comes to projects with an existing right-of-way. The intent is that it be within existing right-of-way. I think there have been some really great questions that have come through um, as people have been using that for the last year about you know, particular easements or, or things like that that are not technically within existing right-of-way. And I think that's something we'll work to clarify um, as we move forward and we've gotten more uh, examples of this programmatic being used, but right now it's for projects within existing right-of-way. And then there's another question um, also, uh, kind of along the same lines about, will DEP be signing a similar letter about the process? And we're actually actively um, in talks with DEP, FWC, and US Fish and Wildlife Service to make sure we're all on the same page. I know the DOT has uh, previously provided some guidance based on some earlier conversations about how this process will work, but we are actively um, continuing that conversation right now to make sure that we're all on the same page and we can provide everyone uh, you know, the same direction and make sure we, we know how the process will be handled for those DEP uh, 404 permits. Um, and then I think we might have one more question. Can the programmatic between DOT and the Fish and Wildlife Service be used by the Corps to address effect determinations and consultation responsibilities during permitting? So this is a really great question. If we're talking specifically about our minor transportation uh, programmatic agreement, you can use it as technical assistance, but the Army Corps of Engineers has not uh, kind of signed on to that agreement. They, they um, uh, just have chosen not to do that so far at this time, but um, certainly something you can use um, and, and present that information to them for their consideration. And they may choose to use it for your project, but they may, may not. So. Um, but again, if we're the lead agency, then they should, then, then that's our responsibility. But if it's if they're the lead, then then no, that's not something they're necessarily going to uh, 
use from their for their own purposes. Um, and I think one more question. So there's a question about the minor transportation um, activities programmatic again, and does it assume protected species involvement? If there's no habitat present within the existing right of way, is the use of the PA provided um, no effect determination justification? So I think um, let us uh, delve into that. It's a lot of questions in one. Uh, let us work on that a little bit. We'll come back to that, I think, at the end of the presentation, if that's okay, just to make sure we're effectively answering that question thoroughly. Um, with that, I'm not seeing any more questions at the moment. So Kendra, I think we can go ahead and um, take a five minute break. We'll be back with Dave Rydine to um, give the last main presentation for the morning. And then again, Mark Cantrell will, will wrap us up um, as we get closer to the end of today's session. So thanks so much, take a five minute break. We'll see you back at, um, I guess, 1020, thanks.
All right, so I might have shortchanged everybody by a minute. Apologies for that. Um, but I think we can get Dave uh, teed up to start the next section of our presentation. Um, all right, thanks, Dave. Take it away. All righty. So my name is Dave Rydin, as you've already heard. I work for No Fisheries. Um, my agency also goes by the name of National Marine Fisheries Service or its acronym NIMS. So if I use any of those terms, it's all the same agency. Um, I'm a transportation liaison and I deal with uh, Florida Gulf Coast projects. So over the next couple of days, we're gonna be discussing ESA section seven consultations and the roles that the FDOT and the other agencies play in the process. Go to the next one. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking today about the administrative record that we have to keep, uh, the various section seven participants and their roles in the process, and a couple of listed species, or a few listed species actually, that NOAA Fisheries and US Fish and Wildlife Sur Service share responsibility for. So um, the services, are required to keep an administrative record that documents all of the coordination that occurs during a Section 7 consultation. And that includes any information or reports that we use when we do our analyses. Um, we have specific rules that govern how we keep the records, how we seek advice from others, how we release information to the public, and also in regards to the quality of the information that we use when we conduct a consultation. So all those rules are laid out in the Administrative Procedure Act. So we keep these administrative records so we can document what occurred during the consultation and how and why we made the decisions that we made. Um, the record begins from the very few first communications about an FDOT project and it carries through until, I'll turn that off because I'm probably a distraction, it carries through until the end of the consultation when the section seven document is finalized and released. So the record should plainly show what our rationale was when we reached the conclusions that we come to when preparing our section seven document and in legal terms, our decisions cannot be what's called arbitrary and capricious, which means that we should be able to explain how we came to the decisions we came to. And if we can't explain, we just say, well, I don't know, that's just what we decided to do. Then we're being arbitrary and capricious. So if we get sued and we go to court and we can't explain how we reached the conclusions that we reached, the judge will be very unhappy. Uh, we will lose the case most likely. And my agency would be very unhappy with the biologist who didn't do a good enough job of putting together the administrative record. But even if we don't get sued, we should still be able to demonstrate what our train of thought was during the consultation process. Another aspect of the administrative record is related to the Freedom of Information Act, which is known by the acronym of FOIA. Uh, FOIA allows the general public to obtain records from federal agencies, and that includes any records the services have about Section 7 consultations. Now, when I, when I say the services, that refers to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA Fisheries or National Marine Fisheries Service. So if I use that term services, those are the agencies I'm talking about. Um, there are some exceptions to FOIA requests, such as the information has national security implications, it's classified information, or maybe it's proprietary information that can't be released to the public for one reason or another. Okay, Section 7 consultations are also subject to the Information Quality Act. So the act requires federal agencies to obtain and use the best available information that they can get when they're doing analyses and making decisions uh, in Section 7 consultations and, and, and in other federal decisions as well. And if we cite information in a consultation, we should be familiar with the document we cite and the information that it 
that was inside of it. Um, there are cases where we can't actually get the best information. It's just not available. It could be uh, owned by a private company that spent a lot of money to get that information, like oil and gas company surveys. Uh, they don't want to just give it to us after they spent a boatload of money to get it, and they don't want the information to necessarily be made available to their competitors either. But we do our best to make sure the information we use is the best that we can get at least. So now I'm going to talk about the participants in the Section 7 process and what their various roles are. So regulatory lead agencies. So the regulatory lead agencies are the ones who conduct the Section 7 consultations. So this would either be U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or NOAA Fisheries, as I said, collectively known as the services. So the regulatory leads provide regulatory policy and biological information to the other players in the process. Uh, this includes the current status of listed species and their critical habitat, if critical habitat has been designated, which is not true for all species. Uh, we coordinate with the other participants regarding a project's potential harmful effects on listed species or critical habitat, and also suggest ways that any harmful effects might be reduced or ideally avoid it altogether, which would be the best outcome, really. So the action agency. Who's the action agency? The action agency is the federal agency that requests a Section 7 consultation from the services. A section consultation must be conducted if the action agency is going to fund, permit, or carry out an action that might affect a listed species or critical habitat and the action agency provides a regulatory lead agency with the best available information they have about an action and its potential effects. Um, they're also involved in evaluating the biological assessment. So the biological assessment is a document that's put together and given to the lead federal agencies um, that explains what the project is, what listed species or critical habitat might be affected, and what those effects might be. Uh, that's usually, for you folks in FDOT, it's usually contained within the natural resources evaluation. And the action agency can't just ask for the consultation and then just sit back and think everybody else is going to do all the work. They have to be active participants in the process. And they also have specific post-opinion requirements that they have to meet. So who are the potential action agencies for FDOT projects? So it could be Federal Highway Administration, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, or other Department of Defense entities like the Air Force or the Navy. Um, could be the Coast Guard, could be Federal Emergency Management Administration, which is also known as FEMA. Uh, FDOT can also act as a, a, an action agency. So FDOT used to be called, uh, was a designated non-federal representative of the Federal Highway Administration. But now it's been given NEPA assignment authority by uh, Federal Highways. So next slide, I'm going to talk more about what that situation is. So as I said, FDOT used to be a designated non-federal representative for Federal Highways. Uh, they were designated as that in writing by Federal Highways. And under that process, FDOT could request Section 7 consultation from the services, but only if it was going to be an informal consultation. And we'll talk about more about what's an informal and what's a formal tomorrow. But if the consultation was actually going to be a formal consultation, then FDOT couldn't do it. They didn't have that authority as a just as a representative. So Federal Highways had to get back involved and ask for the consultation. Um, but if a if you do have a non-federal representative designated, it doesn't let the the real federal agency, the action agency, off the hook. The action agency, the real action agency, is still ultimately responsible for any compliance required by the Section 7 consultation. But now FDOT has a different situation because at the end of 2016, FDOT was given what's called NEPA assignment authority by Federal Highways. And in terms of the ESA, that means that FDOT can now essentially act as if they are a federal action agency and they can request and participate in both informal 
and formal consultations. So that in terms of ESA, it's just a matter of they can do formal consultations now. Okay, the applicant. So the applicant is the entity that needs the action agency's approval or authorization to conduct an action. So in the case of FDOT, if FDOT is the applicant, um, they would usually be getting funding from say federal highways or they need a permit from the Corps or the Coast Guard. So in the regs, they use the term person as far as who the applicant is, but person is really defined very broadly. It could be an individual person, like somebody that wants a single family doc, let's say, but it can also be state and federal agencies as well. So it's a very broad definition of the word person. So the applicant's role. The applicant uh, submits its best available information to the action agency regarding the project and listed species that might be affected and what the effects might be. Uh, the action agency then passes that information on to the services as part of the Section 7 consultation package. If there's a draft biological opinion issued by one of the services, the applicant has the right to review and provide comments on that draft opinion, and those go to the action agency, and then the action agency provides the comments to the services. Also, um, the action or the pardon me, the applicant is entitled to get the final consultation document. Okay, so if FDOT requests a Section 7 consultation since they now have NEPA authority, they are basically both the action agency and the applicant at the same time. However, if it they don't ask for it ahead of time and it gets the permitting, and then the Corps or the Coast Guard, let's say, ask for the Section 7 consultation for an FDOT project, then FDOT is just the applicant and the Corps or the Coast Guard would be the action agency. And so that, that has some bearing on uh, formal consultations because of a formal consultation, you know, we have certain timelines that we have to meet. And you can get a 60 day extension of the timeline if the action agency approves it. Um, to get an extension beyond 60 days, you need approval of both the action agency and the applicant. So in some cases, FDOT's the action agency and the applicant, and we would just have to get concur or agreement on uh, extending the timeline beyond 60 days from them. In the other situation where, let's say the core is the action agency and FDOT is just the applicant, then we would have to get permission from both the core and um, FDOT to um, get that extension. Uh, if there's a formal consultation and it res results in what's called a jeopardy or a destruction or adverse modification finding, which is a bad thing, you don't want to get that. Uh, the applicant actually can apply to be exempt from the Section 7 process. Doesn't mean they'll get the exemption, but they have the right to apply for it anyways. And the applicant is also responsible for compliance with any Section 7 consultation requirements, including monitoring and reporting requirements. So what's the role of state agencies? So the role of state natural resource agencies includes Section 7 cooperation. So Zakia talked about that uh, a little bit earlier. There's a part in the ESA called Section 7 that, that deals with our cooperation, services cooperation with state resource agencies. Um, we're also involved in Section, their states are also involved in Section 7 coordination including assistance during consultations. Uh, state resource agencies often conduct research on listed species or critical habitat that occurs in their state. Um, and Zaki talked about this also. You have, so in order to do research, whether you're a state agency or a university or anybody else, um, you have to get a, what's called a Section 10 permit to do the research. And so that allows you to capture animals and tag them um, you know, take tissue samples, things like that you, that you need to do to do the research. But you do need a Section 10 permit under the ESA to do that. And in Florida, the principal natural resource agencies the services coordinate with are the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, and that would be for animals, and also the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, and that would be in terms of plants.
So how do we coordinate with states um, in Section 7 consultations? So we communicate with the states about actions that may affect listed species or critical ha habitat and ask if they have information or data that might be useful in, in the terms of doing a consultation. Uh, if we're doing, let's say, a biological opinion and we're just about getting ready to issue it, we will go back to the state agencies and say, is there new information that's come about in the interim that we might want to use because we want to be sure, as we said, that we use the best available information we can get. Um, we also recommend that the action agency, once they get a uh, Section 7 document from us, that they provide state research agencies with that document, whether it's a letter of concurrence or a final biological opinion. If, however, the action agency, agency doesn't provide that to the state agencies, um, and assuming that the biological opinion doesn't have some kind of sensitive information that can't be released, uh, the services will actually provide the document to the state agencies after 10 working days. So we also sometimes coordinate with Native American tribes if tribal lands or tribal waters might be affected by a proposed action that's under consideration for a in a Section 7 consultation. In Florida, um, that would be primarily either the Seminole or Miccosukee tribes. So coordination between uh, NOAA fisheries and U.S. And Fish and Wildlife. So there's a, a few listed species that the services have split res responsibilities for. So for instance, sea turtles. So if we're talking about an action that's under consideration that might affect sea turtles when they're swimming around in the water, that falls under NOAA fisheries jurisdiction and we would do the section seven consultation. If however, you're talking about an action that will affect sea turtles when they go up on the beach to nest, then it falls under U.S. Fish and Wildlife jurisdiction and they do the consultation. Um, it's possible you can have situations where the little early, you can have situations where, um, let's say you're going to put a, a rock groin or rock jetty and it starts on the beach and goes in the water, you might have to consult with both services. So, um, now, Gulf sturgeon is another one we share responsibility for. It's a little more complicated than the sea turtles because that's fairly straightforward. So if an action occurs in Gulf sturgeon riverine habitat unit, it is Fish and Wildlife Service's responsibility. If it occurs in a marine habitat unit, which would for Gulf sturgeon would be the near shore Gulf of Mexico, then it's no fisheries responsibility and we do the consultation. However, if the action occurs in an estuarine habitat unit for Gulf sturgeon, whose responsibility it is depends on who the action agency is that's requesting the consultation. So for instance, it's an, an action is in an estuarine unit and US Department of Transportation, which includes federal highways and FDOT or the Environmental Protection Agency or the Coast Guard or FEMA asks for the consultation, then U.S. Fish and Wildlife conducts the Section 7 consultation in the estuarine unit. If, however, the Corps or some other Department of Defense entity or Minerals Management Service, which is now called a BOEM or Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, if they ask for the consultation, then no fisheries conducts the consultation. So that's a little confusing. It took me a while to wrap my head around that. Um, but you might say, well, what about the other sturgeon species because we have two sturgeon species on the Atlantic. We have Atlantic sturgeon, we have short-nosed sturgeon. So that's a more straightforward situation. NIMS always does a section consultation on those species no matter where the action occurs or who the action agency is. Doesn't matter if the fish are way upriver to spawn in freshwater riverine habitat or in there in the near shore Atlantic. It's always NIMS jurisdiction which doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but I didn't write the reg. So um, so that's the end of my part. So now we'll take some more questions maybe, and then Mark Cantrell will close out session one for us. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. I'm glad you uh, wrapped your head around all that nuance. <laughs> I feel like we need a little flow chart there to 
walk us through who's got what jurisdiction when, but um, but thanks for sharing that information and um, appreciate you kind of um, talking about the administrative record as well and how important that is because it's not only important for you all, but you know, kind of like I said earlier, documentation is pretty critical for us as well, uh, whether it's just for the file or for an administrative record if, if we get to that point also. So pretty good, pretty good stuff. And then um, I also thought it might be a good point to um, reiterate your uh, quote on your one slide about the ultimate responsibility for that section seven remains with the federal agency. And so you talked about a lot of different um, scenarios. And at, as I spoke also this morning about the scenario with DOT when we're the lead, you know, we do maintain that responsibility. And so on occasion, um, some folks on in the audience might also know about our LAP projects, our local agency program projects, where other entities are kind of conducting the project, doing the project development and design and construction, but have to go through us um, because they're getting federal money and we, you know, have to support them in that section seven consultation as well. And it's, you know, pretty critical that we're, um, you know, very paying very much close attention when, when those projects are coming through and uh, coordinating with them so that when they do develop their natural resources evaluation or we're doing the consultation um, that we're very cognizant of what those conservation measures are and how they're getting documented as well. So great stuff. Thanks for sharing that with us. Um, we To go back to the previous question that I said that we would go back to, if, um, if Mark uh, or Denise want to jump in and help um, answer this question, that'd be great. But just to um, kind of start off with the question again was about the minor transportation activities programmatic and does it assume protected species involvement? And I'm going to say it doesn't really speak to that per se, but I think it does not assume protected species involvement exactly. Uh, there is the expectation that um, for your project, if you're going to be using the PA, that you're kind of looking um, at the potential uh, species that may be involved in your project, doing your desktop analysis, doing any field work that may be required to kind of help determine whether or not species may be involved. But then if you don't have any actual habitat present, within your project, which is kind of the second half of the question, um, then I think you can make a no effect determination based on the lack of habitat being out there. Um, anybody have anything to add to that response? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll just add uh, briefly, Katasha, that uh, in terms of the, the programmatic agreement for minor transportation projects, uh, we do assume that it's a minor project. And so those are defined and, and there's a big matrix that goes along with that. And, uh, and generally, in general, those things that are uh, uh, occurring within the existing right of way are what uh, we tried to focus on uh, with that uh, programmatic agreement. And in most cases, uh, there's uh, not going to be uh, any uh, habitat for endangered species within that right away with some exceptions and so that that's why the uh, agreement goes uh, goes through step by step uh, how to consider uh, the species that might be present in an area and uh, if they aren't within the right of way or they are not immediately adjacent to the right of way then the provisions that uh, programmatic agreement will help you make that determination so uh, so yeah that's uh, that's in general, the approach that uh, that we took with that agreement, uh, making sure that uh, if there are no species present within the right of way or near the right of way that would be affected, then uh, then you can get to that uh, no effect determination at the end. And so that's that's what the uh, uh, agreement helps you do: uh, step through that and to uh, to take it uh, step by step and make that determination and record uh, the information that you've considered. Uh, about your project and about whether a species is uh, close uh, to the right of way or within the right of way. And if it's not, then uh, no effect is an appropriate determination. Great. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate that follow up. Um, Dave, it looks like we have a couple of questions for you. Um, and we'll start with maybe the more straightforward one first. And then um, just to say that this is essential fish habitat related versus endangered species consultation related, but I still think it might be um, good to uh, help address the questions from the audience. But is do you guys consider it concurrent or approval when we're talking about um, e EFH uh, consultation? Well, I mean, so the word concurrence is, is 
has a sort of specific meaning under ESA. Um, you can use that term for EFH, I guess, but it's usually more related to ESA that that because it's that's the way a term that's used in the regs. Um, yeah, I mean, either I think either one of those terms are sort of interchangeable when you're talking about EFH. You know, we just have to make sure that either the impacts to EFH are avoided or minimized to the point where they're just sort of negligible. Um, and then you would get approval or concurrence from us, yeah. But I think concurrence is a really ESA word, but it could be used for EFH. Okay, yeah, good clarification. I want to say, and I'd have to double check, so I probably shouldn't say this out loud, but I want to say that our manual actually probably does call it concurrence, but we may need to um, <laughs> refine that. Maybe. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a problem with using that for EFH. It's just usually more associated with ESA. Gotcha. Okay. And then I think the next part of that question kind of um, alludes to where you were heading with the minimizing or avoiding impacts, but, and I I'm not 100% sure, but I'm going to try to make sure I get this question right. So is it appropriate to ask for approval of the EFH impacts with associated mitigation during section, I think she's trying to say section seven consultation? And just before you respond to that, um, I, I'd just like to say also that if you recall earlier in my part of the presentation, when we have our natural resources evaluation, we're really trying to address um, the endangered species the wetland impacts and the essential fish habitat impacts all within that same document so that when that technical document goes to say like Dave or Curtis at National Marine Fisheries, they're getting all that information in one document and they can um, go through the consultation process with you for both of those resources at one time. But I think Dave, um, do you have more to add to that response? Yeah, I mean, really the way we do um, the consultations for EFH and ESA are are separate, so they don't you don't have to have them go on the same timeline. And a lot of times, there's enough information available about EFH impacts earlier on in the process that we can actually kind of wrap our heads around that and make a decision earlier than the ESA, where we may need, you know, for EFH, it's not really going to matter um, what kind of piles they use so much, things like that. Or how they're going to put them in um, and usually they have a pretty good idea of what the EFH impacts are going to be and you know maybe they don't quite know what they'll do for compensatory mitigation but um, that usually can be worked out ahead of any ESA consultations where maybe you need more information and those two things are based on two different pieces of legislation so um, they're generally separate consultations. Great, thanks for that clarification. And I, I don't know if I said it earlier, but we did have a really great Essential Fish Habitat webinar last year, which is recorded and available if anybody wants to, to look um, look for that on our Track 5 website that I was talking about earlier. So it does kind of go through some really great project examples. And uh, Dave was a guest star for that one as well. But um, so it looks like that is our last question in the question box at the moment. Um, I think if um, Mark, if you want to go ahead and start wrapping up before you get to the very end, we'll just do one more quick check to see if there's any final questions. But if you want to go ahead and start that process, then um, that'd be great. Thanks. Okay. Well, uh, great questions. Uh, you guys are paying attention, and I really appreciate that. Uh, but we do have some more time, and uh, we all came a long ways to be here. And I think we've loaded your wagon full, but I want to make sure that uh, we answer all your questions. So remember, uh, we started out, uh, Katasha reviewed uh, the NEPA assignment and the distinction of uh, uh, NEPA assignment, federal uh, designation of representative, and, uh, and then non-federal actions. So we talked about that. We talked about uh, uh, ESA compliance, the process, and how uh, Florida Department of Transportation uh, follows the process uh, and how specifically does a project potentially affect an endangered species and if so how and, and so remember we started out with that bit Tasha also talked about uh, some of the keys those are the the organized stepwise checklist that uh, really helps us go through and think about a project 
think about the species that uh, that may occur in an area and uh, and helps you determine uh, whether uh, a species will be affected. And the usual suspects are the ones that uh, that we have uh, keys developed for, and that's the eastern indigo snake, Florida panthers, uh, uh, Florida manatees, piping plovers. Uh, piping plovers again are here a couple of times a year, uh, both during migration and then uh, some uh, some in uh, other areas uh, for nesting. Uh, we also have uh, wood storks and. Uh, and and that key for the wood storks is really helpful, helpful to get us to, uh, 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 to a way to deal with the species uh, if it's uh, in an area. And, uh, and then also uh, recently we have uh, a new key for determination of effects on Florida bonneted bat. So those keys are, are really helpful tools to use. They're tools that, uh, that you should uh, be able to, uh, to go through. Some of those species may not occur in your area, and uh, and for that you can be thankful but if you do have uh, uh, the uh, bonneted bat or any of the other species in your area you'll be glad that you can step through that key and determine uh, in a stepwise progression uh, whether your project uh, may affect or not uh, the species so that's helpful we also uh, remember uh, Katasha touched on the programmatic approaches uh, specifically uh, we talked about mussels and uh, and that uh, that programmatic approach there, and then uh, then we have the minor project uh, effect. So, uh, recalling all of that uh, important information, uh, great stuff there from Katasha. Uh, and I'm reminding you of these things because I, I want you to think about more questions. We don't want to go on uh, uh, and and leave uh, uh, leave questions on the table. So we want to make sure and answer as many of those as possible about what we've talked about today. Recalling that we're also going to Continue to dig a little deeper next time. So we've uh, we've laid a baseline there uh, with things specific to Florida DOT, and then uh, then remember Zakia went through some really important information uh, with the Endangered Species Act itself. The the law uh, that's been in place uh, in its current form uh, with some amendments uh, since 1973. Uh, and she stepped us through that, and specifically, then uh, we went over to uh, uh, to Dave, who talked about the uh, Section 7 consultation process and uh, and what to expect there. So I, I want to make sure that uh, uh, that if you think back, we've covered a lot of ground uh, this morning. Uh, we've uh, touched on a lot of things. You've had a lot of good questions already. I encourage you, if you want to put a question in the chat or to raise your hand. I think uh, Kendra's uh, prepared to be able to get us uh, get us over to you uh, so that we can ask the questions, answer them uh, in the best way possible. Uh, because again, we're gonna uh, uh, we've got time, and we're gonna be uh, uh, going on from this section to the next section next week, and uh, and we'll we'll take questions now. Uh, so, any additional ones, or do you see hands raised? Uh, we uh, we do have. A question about compensatory mitigation for I think for nymphs. So and I think maybe also Curtis wanted to um, also speak to one of the previous questions. So Curtis, if you want to come on and um, I can read the question if you need, but if you've already looked at it, feel free to jump in and answer away. Great, thanks, Katasha. Uh, I'll go ahead and touch on the point that uh, I think Zakia in her presentation touched on it first and then the question about concurrence terminology with essential fish habitat um, came up during the Q&A. Um, one of the things that both the um, essential fish habitat and Endangered Species Act consultations needs is an initial determination that it's going to result in an adverse effect. That's a similarity. But the nature of the consultations differ in that the essential fish habitat, we make conservation recommendations to the action agency, whereas the Endangered Species Act, if you will, has a little more teeth. It, it's requirements, not recommendations. So that that is a distinction that I wanted to share. Um, then the question came up about um, if compensatory mitigation changes or seagrass or mangrove um, for seagrass or mangrove as part of the permitting. Does sorry about my dog uh, behind me coughing. <laughs> the mic probably picked that up. But um, does the consultation need to be reinitiated um, 
or is it assumed that the Army Corps of Engineers approves the mitigation if it's appropriate? Um, the National Marine Fisheries Service frequently requests to approve changes like that if, um, you know, if the project changes and impacts increase, or if even if mitigation was proposed, and by the time the project comes around, uh, it's not a that option is not available, and a different mitigation option needs to occur. Um, it's not so much reinitiation of consultation, but it's continued coordination under that current um, consultation. So, you know, we would request that we review um, the information and then we would provide some agreement that, you know, it does, the consultation is still met or the intent of the consultation is still met, um, even though these aspects changed. If the impacts increase, in the mitigation doesn't, then that would probably need to be um, coordinated um, further. D does that answer the question? I think so. Yeah, that's a great response, Curtis. Thank you. Great. Um, we have another question about timelines associated with the consultation process, and we'll we'll get back onto the ESA consultation specifically. <laughs> um, so I don't know if um, we probably are going to end up covering that in a little bit more detail in the next session, I would assume, Mark, but do you want to just briefly touch on that and then um, confirm that we'll have some more details next time? Okay. Uh, yeah, I want to, uh, uh, to maybe mention that uh, that's a really good question. Timelines uh, involved with uh, with projects and consultation on those projects. Uh, we'll we'll go into more detail uh, later, but uh, basically there's a uh, there's a short timeline, and that is uh, that we've done a lot of the work already with the programmatic agreements and these keys, so that if a project uh, has no effect or is not likely to adversely affect a, uh, uh, a species, then it should be uh, uh, pretty easy to get to a determination of no effect uh, to document that for your records, for our records, and uh, and move on with the other uh, uh, parts of your uh, project planning and construction. So uh, if there's no species and no effect, then uh, then it uh, we want that to be easy and, and routine. In terms of more detailed and more complex projects and uh, and potential effects on listed species, uh, we have a process that will go into more detail in subsequent uh, sessions. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but the the short order there is that uh, that sometimes the uh, uh, formal consultations can take up to 135 days to complete. Uh, maybe more if additional information is needed. Uh, but again. Uh, even the most complex projects uh, that may affect a listed species, uh, once we've gone through the, the planning process and, and enter into formal, formal consultation, uh, the, uh, uh, the intent is to go ahead and wrap those up as soon as possible. Uh, so uh, it does take uh, some time to, uh, to consider all of the potential effects to an endangered species in order to uh, uh, prevent the species uh, from from being jeopardized and uh, as or critical habitat uh, to avoid adverse modification. So uh, we do that as quickly as possible. Sometimes it does take a while, and uh, and and that can be up to 135 days uh, with formal consultation from start to finish. Uh, maybe more if we have to uh, agree to go back out and get more information, uh, sharpen our pencils a little bit more, but. Uh, Stay tuned. Uh, later, uh, uh, later sessions we'll talk in more detail about that and how to uh, to make that easier. But again, we're here to try to keep uh, keep the simple projects simple, and then to uh, to be able to prepare you uh, in later sessions to deal with more complex uh, projects and how to uh, how to make those as easy and painless as possible. Does that help? I think so, Mark. Great. Uh, response for now. More to come. Um, our next question, and I'm really actually excited to see we have folks that maybe are from the specs realm uh, at DOT joining us today, but our next question kind of talks about the strength of the laws and the specs that we have. So I'll start off uh, responding, but if anyone else wants to jump in, please feel free. Um, so how strong are the existing regulations or laws 
without additional DOT specifications for each species of interest. And I would say that um, the, the existing laws and regs are pretty strong. Um, I think between the regs themselves for Endangered Species Act, along with the um, environmental permitting regs that we follow, they kind of like tie in all the Endangered Species Act stuff for us more or less at the end of our project for, for most projects, right, that get permits issued. It's very strong. Um, I think that the DOT specs are really just a way that we uh, provide that direction to the contractor. Uh, it's not so much strengthening necessarily those laws or requirements, it's just a way we express that information or those requirements to our contractors. But I am going to talk about that in a little bit more detail in session two as well. So if you guys want to hear a little bit more about that, and um, hopefully that'll help uh, address kind of how ESA uh, and the specs work together. And then the other part of the question is, do we have any concerns about the current DOT spec language for any certain species? Um, and I would just offer, I'm not sure if the agencies have concerns, but from an OEM perspective, uh, we do uh, try to keep up with those, looking at those, not annually per se, but on a regular basis. And uh, as things evolve, at, uh, so for instance, at National Marine Fisheries not too long ago, they had um, kind of revamped some of their uh, specs that they use with regard to vessel strikes and other things, and we enhanced our species specifications to kind of uh, absorb some of those newer requirements that they have. So we're always trying to make sure we're on the cutting edge of, of those requirements as well. And then the request is for any advice. I'm not quite sure what advice you might be looking for, but I think the advice I would just try to give in general um, is that if you already have requirements in a permit condition that relate to endangered species, we don't typically need additional specifications to support that. Those permits are part of our contract package and are already telling the contractor what they need to do. On the um, occasions where we maybe don't have a permit or some other mechanism to tell the contractor uh, what they need to do with regard to species, that's where some of those special provisions and things come in. And I know these are a lot of terms I'm throwing out there, but um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail next time as well so that you'll have a little bit better understanding. But um, Mark, Curtis, Dave, any additional thoughts on the strength of the laws? <clears throat> so I guess we got that one covered. Oh, Mark, come on. <laughs> well, I'll just add that, uh, that I think the uh, uh, statement that Zakia made was that the Endangered Species Act is probably the most comprehensive and strongest law uh, that uh, the Congress has enacted in a long, long time. And, uh, and it's been in place now for, for, for upwards of 50 years. So uh, I, I think the, uh, uh, the law is strong and, uh, and one element of it that we uh, mentioned at section nine is uh, the prohibition against take and, uh, and all of the specifications are designed so that we don't run the risk of take of an endangered species. And, uh, and so that's, that's important, uh, important because while there are prohibitions against take and there are penalties that defined in another section there of the act, we don't wanna to get to the point that we've already taken an endangered species and have to think about penalties. We want to make sure that, uh, that we have plenty of, uh, uh, Plenty of uh, conditions in place so that we aren't uh, aren't uh, close to that line where uh, uh, where we're taking an endangered species and have not already considered uh, the potential for that take. So, uh, so that uh, that's I think a, a real important clarification to make is that uh, again, while there are uh, prohibitions and penalties, uh, once we get there, we've already got an endangered species that's harmed and uh, and, and and the whole, uh, whole point of the act is to avoid uh, that harm and to avoid uh, uh, impacts to the species and its habitats. Thanks, Mark. Uh, we do have uh, maybe five or six more questions, so we'll continue on with this for now. Um, if section 404 is handled by DEP, is that considered a federal permit? Um, and, and so no, we're not considering that a federal permit. Uh, we I do believe to have that listed under the state permits when we have our you know reevaluation forms or our type two uh, checklist if you're filling those out. So consider the state permit. Um, can consultation, um, oh, I'm sorry, can consultants complete a key for DOT or will it generate a consistency letter 
that then needs DOT to agree with it. So um, that might be a little bit of a nuanced question depending on the district that you're working for, but from an OEM sort of like high level perspective, uh, consultants typically will um, oftentimes support our project by maybe walking through the key and giving us the effect determination that we think is appropriate, but it really should be a DOT uh, responsibility at the end of the day to actually review that information and make sure that we are in agreement that the key was used appropriately and that that you know conclusion is what we would also agree with based on our own you know professional judgment as well so um, whether or not a, a particular district or project manager or whatever might require some other sort of like consistency letter or something like that that would probably be up to them but a uh, big picture though it is our responsibility and we should be re kind of reviewing that work that consultants provide to us um, one more um, EFH question it looks like, and since we have a little time, we'll go ahead and continue on um, with that. And so I don't know if Dave and or Curtis, you guys might want to um, jump in on this, but can one of you touch on the possible EFH determinations such as no effect or how does that kind of relate to the ESA terminology that we typically use? Hi, Katasha. Um, I think the terminology that the essential fish habitat consultations use is avoid impacts, um, minimize impacts, and then mitigate for unavoidable impacts. So it, it's not, you know, that similar. So there's not a whole lot of overlap between those two. Good. Thanks for clarifying that. So in terms of like, let's say the ETDM process, when you're picking a determination in the EST, that would probably be no involvement is what you would pick as far as a determination. So, which is not necessarily an EFH term in terms of the regs, but that's what you'd pick in the EST. If you were reviewing a project, then there was no EFH impacts. Good, thanks Dave. Good point on that one as well. Uh, our next question is if DOT is not the lead agency, at what point would technical assistance be most appropriate? How do you capture those results and share it with the lead agency? So um, I think if you think back to the uh, idea between the pd &E study versus design, um, if you have a project that has a pd &E study, our intent would be that we're um, beginning that technical assistance during the pd &E study. So if you have a state environmental impact report, um, you would be developing a natural resource evaluation, just like you would for a regular federal project. All that same sort of information with regard to ESA, EFH, wetlands would be included. And uh, you would still be sending that information over to the services. Um, and again, that would be uh, technical assistance. They'd probably provide some sort of response back to you guys saying, you know, thanks for this information. We'll, you know, consider it later during permitting. There may be slightly more formal response that you would get, but kind of that idea, right? Um, and so again, that information, uh, if you're in a pd &E phase, would be captured in your SEER, again, your State Environmental Impact Report, which is a equivalent sort of idea to our pd &E, or our NEPA document, I'm sorry. Uh, we call both of those things a pd &E study, right? So, um, and then the Army Corps or the Coast Guard as that lead agency later on in permitting can use those results of that technical assistance to then um, send their information over to National Marine Fisheries or the Fish and Wildlife Service for their consultation purposes. Um, so that's kind of the general idea of how that would work. And if it's a project that starts in design, same sort of idea, you could begin that technical assistance process um, you know, before you get to your permit application submittal. Um, let's see. I'm not quite sure I understand the next question, but I think it may be trying to ask um, what's the difference between like um, a, a may adverse, I'm sorry, may affect not likely to adversely affect versus just a not likely to adversely affect determination. So, Mark, I don't know if you or Dave or Curtis might want to try to address that question. So I'll take a shot at this. So basically, when you first look at a project, you so the, the answer to that question is they're really those are the same thing. So when you look at a project, you say no effect. Well, if there's no effect, there's no consultation because there's nothing to consult on. Or you can say may affect. So if you say may affect, then the next two divergences are may affect, not likely to adversely affect, 
which you're going to be doing an informal consultation, or you say may affect likely to adversely affect, and then you're doing a formal consultation. But may affect, not likely to adversely affect, or just not likely to adversely affect, which the acronym, acronym we usually use is NLAA, um, or you can say M-A-N-L-A-A. So it's may affect, not likely to adversely affect, or just not likely to adversely affect, but they're the same thing. If Mark wants to add anything to that. Yeah, I guess uh, the only thing that I'll add that uh, that sometimes the the distinction that uh, that really makes a difference there is uh, is whether a species is present or not. And if you have the species present, then certainly uh, even uh, even if you're painting the white line and the species is present, uh, you want to make sure that you're having no effect. So species is there. Uh, that's where you sharpen your pencil a little bit more. If the species is not there, that's that's where you can you can uh, can very quickly get to the no effect uh, determination. Uh, but you'll see that same language uh, in both of those determinations, uh, just to make uh, to make you think through it each time. And and so if uh, uh, if the species is there, you should be thinking a little bit differently than if the species is uh, is not there or uh, or or the activity that you're involved in is uh, is not uh, going to cause great disturbance. Thanks, Mark. It looks like we have one more fairly detailed question. So as we uh, try to respond to this question, one more call for any additional questions. And then um, if we don't get more, we'll go ahead and continue wrapping up. If we do get more, we'll, we'll try to address a few more of those questions as well. So. Um, I don't know if everyone's had a chance to read through this question, but let me go ahead and try to set the stage. Um, it's a, a real world question, it sounds like. Um, if the action agency, for example, the Army Corps, were to approve an alternative compensatory wetland mitigation, say in a basin with no credits available from a mitigation bank, uh, for a project that has marine impacts like seagrass or mangroves, and it has already received concurrence from Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries, or the quantity of the compensatory mitigation, um, what, if any, would be the role of National Marine Fisheries or the Fish and Wildlife Service at that point? And I think this kind of is similar to the question that we had before with a little bit more detail and maybe nuance, but if you guys um, want to take just a second to uh, get your minds around that question and see if there's any sort of guidance or thoughts you could provide, that would be great. So if that were occurring on the east coast of Florida on a project that I was working on, um, I would consider that um, a mitigation that is not available would not offset adverse impacts to the essential fish habitat and the consultation would need coordination on that consultation would need to continue so that, you know, the um, responsibilities under the Magnuson-Stevens Act were met. So that that's something that we can handle um, quickly, and you know if if there's a, a formal submittal or response that's needed, we can do that. But you know we try to handle that type of coordination as informally and efficiently as possible. Great, thanks, Curtis. Yeah. Um, I guess things like that that happen at the end do require a bit of extra coordination and just making sure everyone's on the same page with where we are on the project. So thanks for um, thanks for that response. Just to uh, follow up on the the one last question we have in the chat, just in case it's on anybody else's mind, there's a question about recording the session. And yes, uh, we have recorded the session and it will be made available. I think Kendra is already um, poised to get that over to our folks to send that out to the, all the participants as well as post it on our website. So as each session uh, is completed, that information will be uh, available pretty quickly either today or, or tomorrow or before the end of the week for sure um, for everyone that's listening today and then again post it on our website soon. So um, okay, one more quick question. Let's see. Um, ah, tricky one. On projects where the contractor has private staging areas, um, if the wood stork is present and the owner of the staging area fills the property while the DOT is there, who manages that type of action? So I think um, our specifications specifically talk about the contractor's responsibility to let us know 
um, about any offsite areas that they're using. And we have to go through the ESA consultation process if there were to be a listed species present there. So we would need to um, address that species appropriately, just like we would any other um, effect for any other effect that we might have with our actual project construction activities. And so if, um, if the owner does something on their own, completely separate from our contractor, just not being a lawyer, but just you know, kind of thinking off the cuff from a practical perspective at the moment, uh, that would most likely be something that the private entity you know, has to handle. If there's a question of who did what, right? And that's gonna be a little trickier. Um, but as long as we are addressing that ESA concern through the appropriate uh, requirements, our contractors told us what they're doing and, and we've addressed that species appropriately, then I think um, that would be something that the service would have to handle with the private um, owner separately if that wasn't an action that our contractor took. So yeah, more to add, Mark, feel free to add to that question. That was our last one. And then feel free to continue wrapping us up. Thanks so much. Okay, well, uh, I don't have anything more to add to uh, to your answer there. Uh, I, I think you covered that. And, uh, and certainly, uh, if DOT is responsible for it, its actions and the uh, private landowner will, uh, will be responsible for their actions. Um, the, uh, the part that I'd like to mention now is that, uh, that, I, I think we've covered a lot of, a uh, lot of good questions that y'all had about the uh, Endangered Species Act and, uh, EFH. And so, uh, I, I appreciate all those questions, but, uh, I wanted to give you a chance if you, uh, had any more questions, that's fine. We've got more time. Uh, but if you have any reflections or things that you'd like to, uh, to, to stay in general, uh, just uh, uh, we're we're here to here to listen and uh, and also if you have uh, any things if you're anticipating the need for uh, questions and coming up uh, in the next few sessions we're already uh, planned for those have uh, have information prepared to uh, to drill deeper into uh, to consultations and Endangered Species Act uh, and and transportation uh, realm. So, uh, so if there's some things coming up that you want to let us know that you're anxious to hear about, uh, make sure we know about those. Uh, go ahead. Uh, you can raise your hand or, uh, or post a question there in the, the chat box. We'll be glad to field those. Uh, but we don't want to go away uh, with any uh, an unanswered questions, and we don't want to go away without giving you a chance to, uh, uh, to say something that uh, that you feel you uh, you're just being. Uh, led to, uh, to put forth here. So share with us, uh, give any reflections. It's been a busy, busy couple of hours with a lot of information. And uh, uh, so we're here to listen as well as answer questions. And if we don't see any more, uh, we'll remind you, uh, if you have not already registered for the, the next webinar, uh, make sure you do that. And, uh, and be prepared to hear about uh, your favorite species, maybe some species that you hadn't thought about, uh, so uh, and, and different ways of, uh, uh, of handling endangered species and, and the uh, uh, consultation process. So uh, looking forward to those uh, those next Tuesday, uh, same same bat channel. Uh, we're just gonna dig a little deeper. So I don't see anything uh, popping up. Oh, uh, one more question. We'll make sure and, uh, and do that. So, uh, yes, uh, species affect uh, those determination keys. I'm glad you uh, I'm glad you like those. And uh, are any additional ones proposed? Uh, good, uh, good question. And uh, uh, in general, we've been uh, we've been making those determination keys for species that uh, that are the most popular the most uh, frequently encountered and uh, as we want to continue to do that if uh, if we have new species that are being listed or uh, or species and habitats that are being encountered uh, we're certainly open to uh, uh, to help out with those determination keys do we have any in the works right now uh, uh, Denise or uh, or Katasha if you have anything to add there that would uh, that would be helpful Right, from a DOT perspective, we don't have any um, additional ones at the moment that I didn't mention earlier. Um, so 
we we may have some others coming up in the in the future though so definitely be keeping everyone posted as that happens okay and uh and the most recently constructed there was the uh, florida bonneted bat uh, i think that was pretty pretty heavy lift to uh to deal with all of the the details there but uh, by all means uh we try to make it easy and so we uh we want to consider all of the potential uh and usual sorts of uh activities and uh, the usually encountered species uh, to make those uh, determination keys uh, so that uh, uh again we're always uh, always willing to uh to look in more detail to save us all some time uh, so suggest uh an additional species if you keep encountering it and and will help out okay. another questions i i certainly appreciate the uh, the time and attention that you all have uh, uh spent with us this morning and uh with that i guess i can turn it back over to uh, uh to kendra or katasha uh, to wrap things up and let you know where to find things. Again, there's some files to uh, to look at. I'll remind you of those. Uh, Kendra will probably do the same thing. Uh, we've got a number of documents that are there for you to download and uh, and look at. I uh, put a copy of the Endangered Species Act itself uh, in the file. Uh, uh, there's a PDF if you're interested in seeing uh, uh, seeing a lot of the legalese, uh, the actual law itself. Uh, take a look at that file. Also. Uh, drilling deeper, the Section 7 regulations. I was able to locate the most recent and updated copy of the federal regulations, those that uh, uh, Zakia mentioned where it's uh, uh, 402 in the Code of Federal Regulations. I've uh, downloaded those and placed them in the box for you to take a look at. So uh, some, some more files there that, uh, that may be helpful. Uh, by all means, uh, again, uh, ask a question uh, now or uh, be prepared uh, next week uh, for more with more questions and we'll try to get to those as well And so with uh, nothing further, I'll go ahead and, uh, and close us out then. Uh, again, thank you for being here. Look forward to your attendance next week. And uh, in the meantime, we'll be thinking about your favorite species and projects. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, how to initiate consultation, the concurrence, uh, as well as biological opinions. That's where we're gonna get into some of those timelines with uh, the 30 day, 90 day, 135 day uh, issues. Uh, we'll be uh, talking about incidental take, how to initiate consultation, but also how to reinitiate consultation. What happens if something changes? What if your project changes? What if a new species is listed? Uh, we'll try to deal with some of those things next week uh, in, uh, in some more of the uh, nuts and bolts of how consultations work. And then we're gonna get into some uh, uh, species uh, specific highlights and we'll bring in some uh, other folks you won't have to look at uh, the folks you've seen all morning today uh, adam uh, is going to come by from nymphs and talk about small tooth sawfish and then uh, katasha is going to have that really uh, detailed discussion of the uh, uh, fdot specs and uh, look forward to that because i know folks are already thinking in that direction so uh, by all means that's a teaser of things to come i uh, hope you Hope you enjoyed what we've done so far and that we've laid the uh, groundwork for uh, for next week and we'll we'll continue to get more detailed as we go along i just wanted to follow up and say thanks so much for again all the great questions and the great participation we had today and really look forward to seeing everybody next week so thanks so much and enjoy the rest of your day Hey, Kendra, are you there?